Okay. Good morning. If you're out there in the foyer, we ask that you come in and join with us this morning. And those joining us by way of uh, internet, this morning we welcome you as well to Community Baptist Church. And it's Sunday school time. And um, I am going to receive a new prayer request, but I have a few to share. I want to begin with a praise. As some of you heard, the uh, cornea transplant for Joel Ward was a success. Amen. So now he's in just recovery mode. Um, I wanted to mention a couple, and again, I'll come out to you for any additional prayer requests here in a second. Uh, this is Eleanor Smith, who uh, prior to COVID was uh, joining us over in the best part of the church, right over there uh, by Mrs. Ferris. Um, she is undergoing a throat scan of some sort um, this Tuesday. Uh, so there are some concerns, uh, and uh, let's be praying uh, that uh, nothing uh, significant is, is found. Uh, a prayer request that came in uh, to Beth uh, regarding our dear friend, Pastor Herbert, um, now residing with um, his daughter in Tennessee. Um, he is having some real issues uh, involving a crushed vertebrae. Um, a lot of pain, as you can imagine, coming from that. His hopes was to be making his way back to Michigan. Um, but uh, this pain um, is definitely um, bringing down, unfortunately. So let's be uh, keeping Pastor Herbert in your prayers. We did learn that um, uh, Paul Simonetta's uh, nephew, uh, Riley, uh, taking off life support um, yesterday and did pass away. So be praying for his mother, Brandy, and his two siblings. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I don't know what, uh, whether he was saved or not. I don't really know uh, anything. What we are going to pray, though, is that uh, the funeral will be a wonderful opportunity uh, for the gospel to be given out. Um, and uh, so be praying for the Simonetta family. Um, some of you heard that uh, Marge Brody um, passed away, um, and her funeral will be tomorrow um, in Columbia Villa at Jansen Funeral Home. Um, and then, of course, we all know that um, Pastor Fisher and his family, unfortunately, had to receive that really shocking news of his father, only 70 years old. I mean, I'm like right almost there. And uh, that's young. Uh, but his father very unexpectedly passing away. Um, the details for the funeral have been posted in the back on the big bulletin board in the hallway behind the foyer, uh, but the funeral will be this um, Tuesday at New Testament Baptist Church. Uh, if you can make it down to Cape Coral, Florida. And right now, with this weather, I'm game to go. But uh, be praying uh, for the, the Fisher family. Um, and then uh, some very sad news, folks. Yes. Matt Zapp. Everybody even know Matt. Um, his parents, Ed and Mary Zapp, he died yesterday. Uh, yeah, it breaks my heart. It does. But yeah, it does. Matt was not feeling well, COVID issues. His dad went to the home after he didn't answer the phone and found him dead. Oh, my gosh. So, so pray for them. Yes. They've, been, they've been having a struggle. Mary's been having a real struggle with what we call long COVID. Yeah. Now this. So pray for the family. Amen. Praise God. Born again. Amen. He Amen. is absent, but he's accounted for. His body may sleep, but he is very much awake and alive this very day. Right. Amen. Amen. So we praise God for that. Amen. Great so, witness. Yes, that's what I heard, that he would witness of people we wouldn't yes. think of. Yeah. Yes, and if you'd ever gone to Myers, I mean, you'd see Matt as a greeter there. Yeah. So anyways, pray for that. That's very unexpected. I don't know his age, but he was less than 50. 52. Probably. 52, okay. All right, now, other prayer requests? Rosie. Yeah, um, I look. My sister and I will have heart surgery. Okay. Um, Joe. Joe. 
Okay, so we praying for uh, Rosa's sister Joe in the hospital. Gonna have some type of heart surgery, you said? Yeah. Okay, all right, be praying for that. Cheryl. Joe's cornea transplant went really well. The doctor says it's looking really good. Did you cool. hear me say that out there, or are you the bearer of more news about it? We did mention that. And we we're glad to hear that. Amen. That's just the best. That was we started out with that being our praise for today too. Amen. We're so glad to hear that. Now he's got one more to go through yet at some point, right? So this is really the first. Uh, well, wonderful, wonderful. Amen. Other prayer? Yes. I, I really think we should pray for the people of Ukraine. Um, uh, Bruce Tuttle, a missionary friend of ours, uh, no, I was in contact with him a week ago, and they were hunkering down. Uh, he was staying, and I don't think they made it. And then our friends are Meisenbergs. Their parents, her parents made it to Poland. Now they're trying to get refugee status to bring them to Wyoming to their home. So we yeah. pray for them. Okay. Let me pray for all these folks in, in, uh, in Ukraine and uh, this, we're living in a time when this world is changes flip-flops right. just so very quickly and um, so yes Kelly I asked for Andy Miller to pray for him he had his CAT scan or MRI and they think they got it all and go back in a couple months for a checkup well wonderful praise yeah praise the Lord yeah. I hope someday we can see Andy here Amen. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to say first, before we go to prayer, we are so glad to have uh, Kayla Bruner here with us today. Um, I took a look at um, uh, his family. I, I, we don't have access to Facebook, but apparently we can see enough of Facebook before they, they say you got to sign in or something. So we saw some wonderful pictures of... Uh, their three children, his wife Nora, and um, they are in Missouri at this time. So we'll, we'll uh, look forward maybe one day to seeing your family, but we are very glad. Amen. Uh, Brother Bruner will be here uh, for Sunday school, for morning Amen. service, and for this evening service as well. Brother Ken, you may not have heard all the prayer requests, but Brother Ken, the Lord heard them as we were mentioning them. Would you open us in prayer? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for travel, travel safety and through the snow, Lord. And we know that spring is coming, and we thank you for that. Lord, there are many burdens here for people in the church. Lord, we think of pastor as he's having a funeral and his absence. They are prepared for a funeral, Lord. There's much sadness, but yet there's still much hope because heaven is real. Lord, we thank you for this time that we can gather together. And without further ado, I want to introduce one of our newest mates here. Um, if, uh, our, our missionary to be uh, to, the Australian Outback, um, Mr. Caleb Brewer. So come on, Brother Brewer. Amen. You're welcome. Go ahead. Well, man, it's good to be with you here this morning. We're excited about the opportunity uh, to be able to be up here and uh, share God's burden for. Uh, he's given us for the country of Australia. Um, for this morning, for Sunday school, I'd like to kind of just give you uh, my testimony and how God called me to the country of Australia. I have the opportunity to show our video in the morning service, um, but I would like to uh, kind of go into a little more detail what we plan on doing in the country of Australia and open it up for questions. So while uh, we're going through this, if you think of any questions, I'd be more than happy to try to answer any questions you have. And just in case we don't have too many questions, I do have a lesson prepared uh, for backup if we if we have time and and whatnot. But I would love uh, to be able to answer any questions you may have in regard to what God has called us to do in the country of Australia. Uh, my name is Caleb Bruner, and unfortunately, uh, my family is not with me this morning. As was mentioned, they're uh, back in Missouri. Uh, we are actually on the very tail end of deputation, praise the Lord. Uh, we, are, uh, we have somewhere between 85 and 90 percent of our support coming in. Uh, we only need really about four or five more churches to commit to monthly support.
support, and we should be fully supported. At this point, we are transitioning out of full-time uh, deputation travel, and, and, and we have uh, moved, uh, settled in in Missouri. We're sent out of Higher Plain Baptist Church in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. That's where I grew up, and we'll talk about that a little bit in my testimony. Uh, but I have a brother-in-law in southwestern Missouri, uh, has a boys' home, and uh, they just uh, put together a staff apartment there on property, and uh, he has offered that to my family to stay while we transition out of traveling full time uh, and wait for our visas to be approved uh, in Australia. Uh, thankfully, uh, if you've been following anything that's been going on over the past couple of years with COVID, uh, Australia closed down its borders in March of uh, 2020, uh, and they remained closed until pretty much February of this year, so almost two years. Uh, that Australia kept their international borders closed. Uh, they allowed uh, citizens back into the country under very strict uh, requirements uh, and whatnot. And, uh, and back in November of last year, they allowed the Australian people to start traveling internationally again. So not only were they not allowing people into the country of Australia, but they weren't allowing their own to leave the country of Australia. So they took very strong and heavy measures against COVID. Uh, and it worked for a little while. Uh, but obviously, if you've been following the news at all and seeing a little bit of things in Australia, they've, they've had just as much COVID there as pretty much everybody else in the world has. Uh, but anyway, Thankfully, uh, as of February this year, last month, uh, their borders are, are officially open, uh, and uh, we now have a pathway into the country of Australia. Praise the Lord! Uh, we are working on our visas right now, uh, so that's one the one thing that we're waiting on. Uh, it's taking longer than we initially had hoped and planned, um, but obviously, with two years of of having closed borders, there's no telling what's going on in the immigration department in the country of Australia. So uh, we have some immigration lawyers that we're working with in Australia that are helping us with this process. So Lord willing, uh, by end of summer, we should be approved and be able to go to the country of Australia. My wife is expecting our fourth child. Uh, she's due early June. Uh, so originally we were hoping maybe to get to Australia before uh, the birth and be able to get there and settle in and have the baby over there. Uh, but we have been told that not to expect our visas to be approved before that time. Obviously, uh, that deadline would be early May uh, uh, to be able to get over there. So the plan is for us to have the baby here. And then once we're ready after that and have the approvals uh, to go to Australia. Like I said, we would love for that to be uh, end of summer, uh, but for sure before the end of the year. So just pray for us about that as that continues to go. Uh, there's a lot of uh, behind the scenes work that goes on with this. Uh, immigration application uh, that I don't even know about. I've I've submitted my documents and I've done everything they've asked me to do and it's kind of one of those things I just kind of had to step back and wait and it's kind of frustrating sometimes because you're sitting there and waiting for that email, waiting for some, well, what's next? What's the next step? Is there more that I need to do? Uh, but just pray for that, that everything goes well uh, and everything gets approved uh, quickly and that we can get to the country of Australia. Uh, but anyways, uh, we are, as I said, uh, we are settling into Missouri, so my family is down there. Uh, uh, getting ready. We have one last major uh, trip uh, in our deputation. We got about a six-week trip down into uh, Texas, down into the Houston area. Uh, so I, I decided to go ahead and uh, uh, let them prepare for that down in Missouri before we head down there for that last little bit. And Lord willing, we'll finish up the deputation, come back up into Missouri and begin packing and preparing for the move to Australia. So pray for my wife. There's a lot that she's, go, she's working on trying to make sure uh, we get ready for that move. Uh, uh, it's not just about packing a few uh, uh, lug, uh, uh, suitcases and, and flying to Australia. Australia. So we, thankfully, we have not accumulated a lot of things. Uh, when we got married, uh, I already knew uh, we were we were we already knew we were going to be missionaries in Australia. This was the plan. Uh, we rented. Uh, we've not owned a house, so we didn't accumulate a lot of stuff. Uh, but you still do have things that you get, sentimental value things, and, and just things obviously that you need. Want to have some things when we land in Australia. So she is actually in the process of going through our stuff and beginning the process of packing that up. Uh, we, will, we will not be shipping a container
container to Australia. Um, it's just not something that we deem necessary. We don't have enough stuff to constitute trying to get a full container, and, and it's it's not worth the, the cost of that. So uh, with each international ticket, obviously you understand we get uh, we get two free check baggages plus you know uh, up to four per ticket that we pay for, and with it could be up to 50 pounds. So we're pretty much going to Walmart and getting Foot Lockers uh, and that latch up, and we're loading those up to 50 pounds, and then we're going to use that. So we have 12 of those right now and she's going through all that stuff and trying to get it all packed up. We're going to make sure they're at the 50 pound. We want to make sure we keep them at 50 pounds and uh, I'm going through the process of trying to go through my books. I, obviously I, I had, through Bible college I accumulated some books you know and uh, for, for study and different things like that trying to decide you know we're going to have to spread those out through everything. So just pray for my wife as she goes through that and we start packing all that stuff together that we get all that together and we're looking forward uh, to getting to the country of Australia. Uh, it's going to be interesting taking a 13-hour flight with uh, four kids, one of them a newborn, but uh, we're looking forward to it, and uh, we're looking forward to getting over. The kids are excited uh, about getting over there, and, and they would have loved to have the opportunity to meet you. Uh, but let me go ahead and get into my testimony a little bit this morning, and we'll continue on. Uh, I, I was uh, raised in a Christian home. I, I've been in church all my life. Uh, there's never been a point in my life that I've not been in church. Uh, so Sunday morning, Sunday school, Sunday uh, church, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, Day night that has been a part of my life for uh, for as long as I've been alive. Uh, so I'm so thankful for that. My parents, uh, my dad worked with youth when I was young. Uh, he had a ministry, kind of a, uh, a, uh, a, a youth evangelism ministry. And when in my first, second, and third grade years, uh, we traveled in a motorhome and uh, travel around as my dad worked with youth. We settled down in Oklahoma City uh, right about 1996, 97, and I started going to the Christian school there at Windsor Hills Baptist Church. Uh, Pastor, uh, 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 Pastor uh, uh, Jim Vineyard, I was going to say Tom Vineyard, it's Pastor Tom Vineyard now, but at that point it was Pastor Jim Vineyard, uh, Dr. Jim Vineyard, and uh, I was able to start going to the Christian school there, and I started in the fourth grade, so I'm thankful for the opportunity that I had to grow up in a Christian home, an opportunity to go to Christian school. And uh, it was there uh, at, the, at school uh, in the fifth grade that I accepted Jesus as my personal Savior. Uh, I had made a profession of faith when I was young, uh, something my parents had told me about. But as I got older and would look back on uh, earlier in my life, I couldn't really remember it. I didn't have any uh, memories of that time. I, I didn't know where it took place. I didn't know uh, who I talked to, uh, what anything. I really had no memories of it. Uh, and I don't doubt anything, and I, and I don't fault my parents one bit. They, uh, they tried to keep in front of me uh, what they knew that I had told them uh, at a young age. Um, but for me, I had no memory of it, and, and that began to uh, that began to bother me, and uh, the, uh, the devil began to uh, insert doubt into my life. and uh, And in chapel service in the fifth grade, uh, I got that settled, and uh, no one hundred percent sure that when I die, I'm going to heaven. Praise the Lord for that. So thankful for that. And uh, in the sixth grade, uh, we had to do a research paper. And uh, obviously for, uh, for students, uh, research papers are generally the most exciting and most loved assignments that you can ever get. Uh, and I don't, know, I don't know how it is. I've only ever been in the Christian school there. I don't know how it is, but we did a research paper every year pretty much from fifth grade until I graduated. Uh, so I did plenty of research papers. Uh, but in sixth grade, we were directed to do a research paper on a country of our choice. And uh, I figured if I have to write a research paper, I don't remember how many pages it was supposed to be. Uh, I, know it wasn't, I know it didn't have to be typed. We, had a, we, we wrote it out. I don't remember. It was probably short, maybe five, six pages. You know, not something that big or significant as a sixth grader. Uh, but I figured if I'm going to do a research paper, I want to do something that's exciting and that's interesting. And that's important. There's no young people in here right now. But if you're going to do a research paper, pick something that's interesting. Uh, it makes it a lot easier. Uh, but I decided to do Australia. Man, they got crocodiles and snakes and spiders and kangaroos and, and sharks and all kinds of fun, exciting things. I mean, it's going to be easy to do a research paper on Australia. So I picked the country of Australia and I did that research paper, went to the library, checked out books, and really uh, that research paper started an interest in the country of Australia for me. I began to, I continued
continued with it. It didn't end with my research paper. I liked Australia. I learned about Australia. I watched uh, documentaries about Australia. I watched Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter guy, and, and uh, you know different stuff. And I, I enjoyed and loved all things Australia. It was interesting to me. Uh, it was exciting to me. And uh, I, I, lo I loved it. And I did that research paper. I don't know what I wrote about. I guarantee you most of it was probably about animals. Uh, so I don't have that research paper to this day. But in the sixth grade, I did that research paper. Little did I know uh, that God was going to use that in my life later on. Uh, as I, like I said, I was going to the Christian school there. And as I got older into junior high and high school, uh, we had missions conference every year at our church. It was a week-long missions conference. Uh, for uh, I think uh, pretty much, I think it went a Sunday to Sunday. It was a week-long missions conference uh, at that time. And we always did it um, right there at the beginning of February. Uh, back home in my home church, January is always what we would call stewardship month. And uh, we'd spend the entire month as a church, Sunday school, and as a church, studying. And a pre uh, pa uh, pastor would, uh, would preach on stewardship, on, on being a good steward with what the things that God has given us. Obviously, uh, most of that was dwelling on our giving and financial. And every, and every service during that month, men would come up during the offering and give uh, testimonies about God has blessed them as they've been faithful to give their tithes and offerings. And then... When that was done, right at the end of Stewardship Month, we would have Faith Promise Missions Conference. And then that would transition into uh, testimonies about Faith Promise and everything. So we would have that Missions Conference. And we had many missionaries that would, came through our church during that time when I was, uh, when I was in school and present their ministry. And uh, Dr. Vineyard had a tremendous heart to reach uh, the world with the gospel. And we support uh, many mi missionaries and had the opportunity. I remember as a kid walking through the fellowship hall and seeing the tables and just exploring all the different uh, unique items and things and uh, trying to talk to the missionaries a little bit. I was kind of a shy kid, so I didn't do a lot of talking. I did a lot of reading and just standing there and looking at things and let other people talk and I would listen. Uh, but I remember enjoying uh, uh, that experience and getting to see the presentations and, and uh, it always happened during the school year in February. Uh, so during the day, all the missionaries would come over to the school and we would spend all morning in sessions uh, with the missionaries and they would uh, show their videos to us. We'd get to ask them questions, uh, uh, very important questions like what do they eat and what do they wear and what language, you know, just getting to talk and, and ask questions with the missionaries. So missions was, expo I was exposed to missions uh, very much from, from a young age. And man, I really enjoyed missions conference, getting that opportunity. And as I got older, like I said, into high school, the Lord really began working in my heart. And I began to realize that this interest that I had in Australia uh, was no longer an interest just in uh, crocodiles and snakes and, 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 and kangaroos and the wildlife and the continent of Australia. But the Lord was really beginning to give me a burden for the people of Australia. And it was through that uh, it was through that, uh, that research paper. Uh, I can't take you to a specific uh, message that was preached, uh, a, a, a missionary or a, a preacher, uh, a certain time, a certain meeting. It wasn't a missions conference. There wasn't a specific um, point in time that I can point to that God called me to missions. But through the process of growing up there, uh, in the church and in the ministry and being exposed to missions. Uh, like I said, God used that research paper in the sixth grade uh, to burden me and lead me and direct me to the country of Australia. Uh, so God has called us to go to the country of Australia uh, as missionaries. Um, and we'll be working with uh, a veteran missionary, Jim Heberly. And uh, as w I took my first uh, trip over there in 2016, I uh, met with Brother Heberly and kind of saw a little bit of what he was doing. And, and honestly, it was a two-week trip real quick for uh, uh, a trip to Australia. We spent one week in, in the Sydney area, in Sydney, kind of doing a lot of just tour stuff. I was just deer in headlights. Yay, I'm in Australia. I did this research paper on it in sixth grade. I'm finally here, you know, and really a kind of a tourist trip for me more than a survey trip because I was just excited to be in country. Uh, but I got to see that and see what Brother Heberly was doing. And, uh, and you'll see some of this in the video, but I will share it with you this morning uh, as we get into this. 85% um, of the population of Australia live within 31 miles of the coast. 
Uh, so Australia is a very large country. It's the sixth largest country in the world as far as land mass. Uh, it is the world's largest island. Uh, it's comparable in size to the United States as far as land mass. Uh, it's only got about 25 million people total population in comparison to 325 million uh, here in the United States. Uh, so it's got a, a relatively small population of people uh, in that uh, large area with the vast majority of that population living along the coastline. And because they're there, um, the majority of the population live in urban city areas. 66% of the population live in one of the uh, six uh, capital cities there in Australia. Uh, so uh, very urbanized country. Uh, and obviously, when you a lot of times when you think of Australia, you don't think about the city. You think about the outback. You think about the ruggedness. You think about the, the snakes and the wildlife and all that crazy stuff over there. Uh, but the vast majority of the population do live in these urban areas on the, in the, on the coastal areas, especially the east coast, the southeastern area. Five million people are in Sydney, the largest city. That's 20% of your population right there, just in that one city uh, in Sydney. Uh, so uh, as we went over there and we began to uh, seek the Lord of what he wanted us to do in Australia and where he wanted us to be, uh, we, we part, we, uh, I met brother with Brother Heberly. He, he was a graduate of Oklahoma Baptist College, the Bible College that I I went to. Uh, he was in college when I was in the Christian school. Uh, so I met with him and, uh, and we saw what he was doing. Brother Heavily started a ministry reaching out into the outback towns in Queensland, Australia. Queensland is the northeastern state uh, in Australia. It's the cattle capital of Australia. They raise a lot of beef there. Uh, so there's a lot of agriculture and, and, um, and stuff up in that area. And there's a lot of small outback or country towns. When I say outback and what we reference in these outback towns, what I'm referring to, uh, what we would call it here in the States would be just small country towns, rural communities. Uh, we're not necessarily going to be going out into the very center uh, of the continent, in the middle of nowhere, uh, where it's uninhabitable. There's nobody there, so we're not going to go there. Uh, but uh, we are going to be working out into these country areas, into these small outback towns. And Brother Heavily started a ministry reaching out into these areas. As I said, the vast majority of the population live in these urban areas and in the surrounding suburbs of those areas. Uh, but there is a uh, population of people that live in these small outback towns. Uh, there's only about 160 Bible preaching churches uh, that I've been told, uh, and that's what's been sh shared with me, in the entire country of Australia. Uh, the average church size in Australia would be 25 to 50. A large church would be 50 plus. Uh, so there, there's not a lot of uh, outreach in the country of Australia. The fastest growing religious classification of Australia is no religion. Uh, you'll see in the video, it's an, it's an older number, uh, but in 2011, it was 22% of the population that claimed no religion. Uh, they've released some newer numbers. I haven't had time to really get into them, but it's somewhere between 30 and 35% of, of the population now estimated that claims no religion. It's the fastest growing classification. There's no religion really that's making any headway or gains uh, in, in the country of Australia. Essentially, that's my generation uh, in the time frame of this, this, this no religion growing that have grown up in a home. They've never gone to church. Uh, they've never read the Bible. Uh, they have really no idea what uh, true Christianity really is. They have uh, no knowledge, no basic knowledge of, of the Bible. Uh, it's never been a part of their life. Uh, not because uh, they hate God. It's just... It's just never been a part of their life. They've never been introduced to it. They don't know uh, anything about true Christianity. Um, and so when you get into these outback towns, obviously uh, what you find very quickly is there, there are no churches in most of these towns. And when I say no churches, I'm not just saying no Bible preaching churches. There's no churches of any kind many times. Uh, in these areas. The largest religions in Australia would be uh, the Anglican Church and, uh, and, the, and the Catholic Church, which are essentially the same. And, and many times you'll go into these towns and there's not even a Catholic Church uh, there. And if there is, it's, it's just a building and there might be someone that shows up every once in a while to collect some money and then goes back. It's, there's just, uh, there, there's no witness 
out, no full-time witness out into these areas. So Brother Heberly started a ministry reaching out into these towns. The Lord burdened him uh, for the people in these small rural outback towns. And he started essentially what would uh, what, what I like to call a modern-day itinerant style ministry. If you think back into the early days of our country, we had the circuit-riding preachers. They get on their horse and they, and they travel from town to town and they pastored. And they were responsible for being the pastor for multiple churches. Um, but obviously at that time, they couldn't be in every church every Sunday. Uh, but they traveled in, in, in their area and they would travel from church to church. Brother Heberly has started a ministry similar to that. When we were there, uh, I was able to go with my wife and our youngest, uh, Molly, in 2019. In the fall of 2019, right before everything went crazy, thank the Lord we were able to get over there and take a three-week trip. And we got to visit three different towns uh, with Brother Heberly uh, that he has started churches in. And when we were there, essentially he had three towns they had started churches in. So he was going into those towns essentially once a month. Uh, so one weekend he'd be in one town. Uh, he'd have church services on Sunday, go home, and the next weekend he's in the second town. Third weekend he's in the third town and just rotate through them like that. And that is the ministry that Brother Heberly has started. And uh, he's able to start those churches. Uh, that The first church he started, they now have their own pastor. They're able to meet regularly three times a week. They do not have to depend and wait on Brother Heberly to show up once a month. But the other two are, are still dependent on Brother Heberly. So he is going in and ministering in those areas. Obviously, COVID has affected his ability to be out there and travel and get to those areas as much as he would want to. Uh, now it's, it, it's, it's much easier. I believe he is still he's able to get out there regularly now. But obviously, over the past couple of years, uh, travel restrictions were pretty strict even in, within the country of Australia. Uh, so we are desire to work with Brother Heberly in this ministry. We desire to help him uh, with the churches he's already started uh, so that they begin, can begin to grow and be more established. You can imagine uh, trying to start a church and establish a church and, and, and give them a solid foundation and teach them. And with many times with people who have no foundation in the Bible whatsoever, uh, once a week, or excuse me, uh, one time a week, once a month, you know, one Sunday a month. Uh, so we desire to get over there and help him with these churches so that they can begin to meet more regularly, but also to reach out and to other towns. There are hundreds of outback towns that have no gospel witness whatsoever. And, and it's not like they could just drive to the next town to go to church. Uh, it would, most of these towns, uh, there's no good church with the within driving distance, within reasonable driving distance uh, of them. So it's our desire to go over there and work with Brother Heberly in this ministry, reaching out into these outback towns with the desire of first uh, preaching the gospel, seeing people saved, and then after that establishing churches in their area so that they can begin to come together and meet and reach out into their own areas uh, and spread the gospel in that way. So we're very excited about that. We'd ask that you pray for us. Uh, it is an exciting thing. We're, we're, we're looking forward to getting over there and having the opportunity to share the gospel with the people in Australia. I'd like to open it up for some questions now. If anybody's got any questions, I'd love to try to answer any questions as we uh, finish up Sunday school this morning. Yes, sir? Well, it's kind of a weird question, but do you remember what score you got on your paper in Australia? I do not. I do not. I do not. I, I wish I had it. I really do. Uh, and, and, and to be honest, it, the significance of that paper didn't really become clear to me until later on in college. I, I mean, I was already, I, in, in, by the time I was in high school, I knew God wanted me to be a missionary to Australia. But I wasn't really thinking about the fact that it was because of the research paper. It just, that's what God wanted me to do. I just knew in my heart, that's what God wanted me to do. Uh, and I'll tell you the story to kind of explain how this kind of started to make sense to me. And the Lord showed this to me. Go to Bible college. Of course, the co Bible college I went to, Oklahoma Baptist College, right there uh, 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 in Oklahoma City, my home church. Uh, so I got to go to Christian school, church, and Bible college, all right there on the same property, uh, and get all my education and training right there. What a blessing that was. But I was going to Bible college, majoring in missions, going to the country of Australia, knew all of that, and comes down to my senior year, uh, preparing for ordination. Uh, really big step uh, in, in your ministry, kind of a scary thing. Uh, but preparing for ordination, one of the basic basic parts of ordination is submitting your salvation testimony and your call to ministry. And uh, I wrote out my salvation testimony, no problem there, that one's easy, but I began to think about my call to ministry uh, because it, for me, as that God wants me in 
Australia. I know God wants me to go to Australia, but I couldn't. You know, I've heard the testimonies from preachers and, and missionaries and, you know, certain times, and they can point to those times. And we had an assistant pastor there, Brother uh, Joe Finn. Uh, he talks about how, you know, he pulled over on the side of the road and God was calling him and he surrendered to the Lord right then at that time. You know, you hear those testimonies. And I was thinking back in my life trying to find that point. I was trying to find a, a, an actual point in time, a, 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 a conference or a, a service, and I really couldn't think of that one point in time that I was like, that's when God called me into ministry. And it began to bother me. I'm like, I know God wants me to be a missionary in Australia, but I don't know how to say it. <laughs> you know, I was like, I've, you know, I was trying to write this out, and I actually went into our vice president of the Bible college at the time. He was my youth pastor, uh, Brother uh, Bob Ross. And, um, and uh, I sat down with him and just began talking to him. And it was through talking with him that we kind of brought it back to that research paper in the sixth grade and how God used that in my life. And, and, and so that really kind of became clear to me. I, I wish I had that paper. I don't know what I got, uh, but I know I wrote about the animals. I know I wrote about the animals because that's what I loved about Australia at that time. Um, but I'm so thankful for simple things, you know. So many times it's these small things in life that God uses to direct us and lead us in life. And it's so easy for us to miss them. It's so easy for us to miss it. You can have any interaction with the animals where you're going. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We'll be watching for kangaroos all the time as we're driving on the road. That's going to be our number one probably danger that we face over there. It's just we do not want to just wreck a car in the middle of nowhere because a kangaroo jumped down in front of us. So we'll make sure to get a decent vehicle. A lot of times, if you spend a lot of time driving in the outback areas, out in these areas, you get, make sure you get the bars in front of your car. So if you do hit a kangaroo, it doesn't destroy uh, your engine. You can actually get into town. Uh, because if you're out in the middle of nowhere, uh, there's no signal. Uh, you can't call for help. Uh, there's not a lot of people coming by on the road, so it's not like you're going to wave anybody down. Uh, so that can be very dangerous. So you obviously want to make sure you're making the proper preparations, make sure people know uh, that we're going to such and such place, and if we don't make it there, come find us, <laughs> you, know, you know, different things like that. So um, it, 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 it's not something that Brother Heberly has never uh, been disabled out in the middle of nowhere. Um, but in fact, while we were there, he was pulling a trailer and he got a flat middle of nowhere, out back Australia. We were driving on a uh, dirt road and it was interesting. We were in, it was like a palm tree forest. It was really weird. We were driving through, and there was a whole bunch of palm trees because there was a river that was running through. And he blew the tire pretty much right at the river crossing. And we had this little, the little bridge that was going across. And, but he had a spare. We got out, changed the tire and everything. But well, thankfully, we weren't stuck. But that was just one of those reminders. Make sure you're prepared for those situations so that you do not strand yourself in the middle of nowhere. Because we were in the middle of nowhere at that point. Uh, so that would be uh, the number one thing. That Obviously, snakes is something you have to watch out for. That's one thing people always like to talk about. Uh, so Australia has about, 100, about 175 different species of snake. Uh, uh, 100 of them are venomous, and 10 of them, 10 of them are the most venomous in the world. Uh, so they do have the most, what is considered the most venomous snake in the world, uh, the Taipan. Uh, so uh, obviously, snakes are something that you just... You adjust to, you learn to look and watch for, and you make the preparations for. But uh, they are well prepared for those things. All hospitals are generally well stocked with, with antivenom. Uh, and so if you can get to a hospital, that's great. But uh, the problem is if you're in the middle of nowhere. So obviously, you have to be really careful when you are out in these areas. So, so yes, interactions with wildlife for sure. While we were there, we got to see a koala in the wild, so that's something that's unique. Not everybody gets to see a koala in the wild because they're usually up in the trees hiding and whatnot. So. A uh, couple, couple questions. Your plan of when you get there, when you go out, you show up in video, how, how do you plan to um, acclimate or get into these villages? Do you go door to door? Do you go in there and meet friends? Uh, build relationships, how, how do you go about it? Then I have one more too. Okay, so uh, pretty much one of the first steps we would take when going into a town for the first time is do what we would call letterboxing. Um, the number one way for you to get 
gospel literature and your information into someone's house is to put it in their mailbox. And they call it a letterbox. It is legal in Australia to put information in someone's mailbox. Uh, so that is the first thing we would probably do. We would canvas the town uh, by putting our flyers or our information tracks, uh, gospel literature. Uh, out on my table, there is a packet that has uh, John and Romans. Uh, it's a couple tracks and, and a letter. It's for a ministry called Word for the West. Uh, one week out of every year, uh, a group of people get together from several different churches uh, in Queensland, in the Queensland area, and they go out into a certain area in, in the outback of Queensland, and they do a mass distribution of uh, those packets, and they put them in every um, letterbox in that area that they're in. We got to participate in that in 2019 while we were there. It's one of the reasons why we chose the time that we went. And I think we distributed somewhere between 20 and 25,000 uh, of these packets uh, in several different outback towns uh, throughout the area, just sticking them in, in mailboxes uh, uh, all over the place. And we had, I think we probably had somewhere between 70 and 80 people all together that gathered for that. We rented a uh, tent and little cabin areas in the caravan park there in town uh, and camped out for the week and rented a building in town for meetings and meals uh, during the week. And we did that. And they do that, every, they try to do that every year. So it's a great ministry and get the gospel. So that's step one. Uh, just go out and, and begin to distribute uh, your uh, literature in that way. But then also, like you said, to develop relationships. Uh, you're going to begin to try to meet people. Uh, so uh, the, the first thing we're going to do is not necessarily just, you know, be full on, let me say this right, full on gospel. Right. Um, gotcha. You're going to try to develop a relationship uh, with people. Um, like I said, many people have no religious background, which means they're not interested. And like I said, it's not necessarily because they hate God, but they're not interested. Um, Brother Heberly told me, we had this conversation while we we're over there, you're going to have to redefine what a win in the ministry. And he was like, uh, you have to redefine what you consider a win in the ministry. I grew up in Oklahoma City. Uh, it's a pretty easy place to, to witness in Oklahoma City. It's not too difficult. Uh, many people are religious. They're familiar with church. They've gone to church. In fact, my church for years, uh, large bus ministry. Uh, it was not uncommon to knock on doors in Oklahoma City and for someone to say, oh, yeah, I rode, I rode the church bus to your church, you know, when I was a kid. You, you heard that quite often. Uh, so, you know, going out on TV soul winning every Thursday night or, or going out and so on. A, a win would be, you know, presenting the gospel to someone and even seeing someone saved. Uh, Brother Heavily was trying to uh, show me that in Australia many times, especially in some of these outback areas, a, a win would maybe get to have just maybe a 10 or 15 minute conversation with someone. And guess it, it may not even have anything to do with the Bible. If you could just have that conversation, you're, you're a stranger, they don't know you, they don't trust you. And not only are you a stranger, you're an American. Uh, there's not necessarily an anti-American uh, sentiment over there, but they, they don't desire to be an Americanized. Uh, so if you jump out as an American with religion right off the bat, uh, I don't want that American religion. Uh, and so you, you do have to be wise in, in that response. If you, uh, we hear about a lot, you know, small town mentality. Uh, if the first person you talk to in a town, you offend in some way, you, you're essentially done. You, you could essentially eliminate any possibilities in that town. So you have to be careful. You have to be smart. You have to be wise. So developing uh, uh, relationships, uh, participating in, in town events, uh, just showing up, you know, on the weekend, you know, if, if he's going there once a month, every, you know, being a regular, showing. And, and it takes time. It takes effort. Developing relationships. Meeting that one person. Developing that relationship with that one person. Uh, beginning to share the gospel with that one person. Because that one person has friends. And if you can gain the trust of the one, that's going to open doors to others. And it's just going to go from there. Uh, so it does take time and effort. But the, the first step would be 
letterboxing. That is one of the key things that we would do. Uh, there is other ways you can have special events. Brother Heberly has done like special, um, like a, a special Easter service or Christmas service, uh, a VBS for kids. Um, he's participated. Some towns like ha, will have like a Christmas fair. Uh, and they'll do a booth at the Christmas fair and they'll hand out the gospel and do different things like that. Just participating and being a blessing and help in the town. Because your desire is to, is to witness the people. And in order to do that, you've got to show them that you care. And so you have to just be there. So, yes, ma'am. Oh, you had another one. Yes, sir. Uh, one, one other question I have. You talked about your books. Uh, that's kind of dear to me. So, what would... would you know, would you consider if a church or a group of people were to ship your books over so you have your books there, what would that cost? I don't know. I've not really looked into it. We should be able to get most of it into some of these bins. We just have to make sure we spread it out. Obviously, we can't load one of these bins all up with books. So it's just a matter of making sure we spread it out. Obviously, going through some stuff, I probably have duplicates of some things, some things that I don't need. It was one of those things in Bible college anytime. Uh, we had a conference or a special speaker come through and they had a book table. I always tried to at least get one or two things off their table. Um, and then, you know, we had a, a, a used book guy that came through all the time. And he had all kinds of stuff. So I just stuff I collected. So I just have to go through it. And so that's just that, that regard and learning, trying to decide what it is that we're going to try to take over there to alleviate that. But I, it, it would be, I would, I would imagine it would... It would be somewhat expensive, but I have not looked into what it would cost to ship just books in general. Oh, I want to know if you were going to start with that circuit, if you were going to join his circuit with the churches. So uh, that is our plan to work directly with Brother Heberly and helping him. So obviously, initially, we will work with him. I'll be traveling with him into these towns, learning uh, the ins and outs. You know, he's got experience of what to do and what not to do when going into a town. So learning those things. And as we become uh, acclimated and start learning these things, we'll begin to more than likely the desire would be for us to develop uh, a, a circuit of our own uh, and begin reaching more towns. So he's working in towns and, and we're working in towns, but we're coordinating together. Uh, so that is the goal. Uh, we, in order to get into the country of Australia, we are we need a sponsoring a sponsor into the country. So we have a, a pastor and a church uh, in Australia that is sponsoring us in. So when we first get there, we're going to settle in and we're just going to plug in into that church and, and help that church and assist that church. And as the family gets settled, we get a place to stay, a place to live, and we get acclimated. We begin to uh, uh, get to that point and then we'll begin reaching out and traveling on the weekends into these areas. So I, I, I'm definitely going to be careful not to just start hitting the road immediately. I want to make sure my family can be able to adjust and acclimate. So we do have a good network. We have a church and, and, and a pastor there that are bringing us in, and we'll be able to just plug in right there with them and work in that area. And that'll be kind of our home base for our ministry. When, when um, the pastor starts a church and help that, is it an actual church you built, or is it in people's homes? Um, so initially, you'll probably meet in people's homes. That'll be the start. Uh, Brother Heberly, generally, uh, after he gets a group of people together and gets that the church to the point where they can kind of start the church, uh, they begin renting a community building. So a lot of the a lot of these smaller towns, there's a there's a women's organization um, in a lot of these outback towns, and they have like a community center. It's a small building. It usually has a small kitchen, a meeting area. Some of them even have a piano. Uh, and so they'll rent that building for the weekend. And they will use that to meet, uh, and that'll be their church. So uh, they, generally they will, they, will, they will not be building a building. Uh, property, purchasing property and building uh, buildings is very expensive. Uh, and so these churches will probably never be able to get to that point themselves. But there are community buildings that are available for rent and relatively cheap to rent them on the weekend. Uh, so that's, what, that's generally the process that he uses. They rent a, 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 ta a building in town that they can meet in. So one town they, they meet in that building. It has a piano, a kitchen, and a meeting area. And then another town they rent the, uh, uh, one of the, uh, an auditorium uh, community building there. They don't use the actual auditorium because it's too big. But they meet in the lobby you know, so it's their it's theirs for the weekend. They set up chairs and they meet in the lobby area. It's a nice, you know, big lobby area for them to meet. And there's a kitchen right there and bathrooms and everything. So it really works well. So that's what they generally do: is rent a community building in town. 
Yes, sir. The 25,000 letterbox that were sent out, do you have any idea how many responses they get? I don't. Um, it, it's pretty low percentage, um, but they do get some calls. Uh, they do get some responses. Uh, and obviously that's the desire, you know, that one person that might have some interest could be that one, that one, that, that inroad into that town. So follow up you have to that afterwards? Um, so Brother Heberly, that, um, so there's, I think there's three different phone numbers and email addresses on, uh, on the contact information, two of the pastors that headed up and then Brother Heberly's. So they just coordinate together and obviously Brother Heberly does most of the traveling because that's his ministry and everything and so he'll a lot of follow up and a lot of uh, he does a lot of ministry he and his wife do a lot of ministry over the phone because of just distances uh, a lot of counseling a lot of ministry over the phone so uh, a lot of follow up that way and obviously if there's through the phone call if there's desire to get together and actually uh, sit down and have a conversation he will you know work that out where he can get out there and and do that. So obviously they try to coordinate together and the places that they go and do distribute to try to at least be able to, you know, Brother Hebrew was like, yeah, we can get out, try to get out into these areas. And obviously it's just him, so he can only go to so many at one time. You know, essentially his limit would be three or four. You do more than four churches at a time, um, then you're, it's two, once every two months that he's showing up. Uh, and so essentially he, he's limited, limited to about three or four towns at a time that he can be actively you know, in. So. You talked a lot about peer schooling. What about schooling for your children? I don't know, you didn't say the age of your children. So we homeschool. Uh, we'll homeschool, and in Australia, we'll be able to homeschool uh, our children, so that, uh, so that is uh, a blessing. Uh, we use ACE. There is an ACE distribution center in Brisbane, uh, Queensland, Australia, so we should be able to homeschool over there. Uh, we will have to register with the Queensland government, uh, but it's really not too much different than registering in some states here in the United States. You know, different states have different requirements uh, for homeschooling. I know a lot of states require some type of registration or something like that. Uh, Oklahoma doesn't really require anything, but I know there's, there's different, different requirements in different states. So we will have to register with the government. We'll have to submit um, uh, uh, stuff to the government so that they can just follow up with us. But it is allowed, and we'll be able to homeschool. Uh, my oldest is uh, is nine, and then uh, seven, and four. So I got two of them in school, and one that's she wishes she was in school, and she does school when her brother's doing school. You know, colors her pictures and does her pages. So she's definitely ready for school. Yes, sir. Um, she can not watch how many New Testament uh, missionaries do you think are in Australia? So there's probably somewhere between 16 and 20 uh, missionaries uh, that I know of. That's kind of the number I've been quoted. I know of one, two, I think three that are currently on deputation that I know of. Um, there's one that I met on deputation that he has made it over there. He is an Aussie citizen. Uh, he is an Aussie, and originally he moved here to the States, went to Bible college. He's going back as a missionary. So he's actually, he was able to get over there uh, l last year, back in August. So uh, I was kind of giving him a hard time. You know, he's got citizenship, so he was allowed to get in. Uh, but anyways, um, uh, so there's some, I think there's somewhere between 16 and 20 uh, independent Baptist missionaries over there in Australia. Yes, sir. So tell us about the mission board. Are you operating under a mission board? And secondly, uh, what impact is the inflation having on what you projected would be your financial need? Because uh, I would assume they're, they're going to experience the same rises in prices for things as we're right. here. Uh, so we are sitting out of our, our home church. They essentially are my, my, my board. We don't have a, a board. We have uh, the, our church is actually the sending church for... Uh, several missionaries, and so we have a, a mission secretary who handles all support uh, for us. So uh, we we don't re we we are not out of a, a board, uh, just out of our our home church there in Oklahoma City, Higher Plain Baptist Church. As far as uh, inflation, obviously uh, the numbers that we use to calculate our support were done in 2019, so pre-COVID and, and pre-war in Ukraine. Uh, so obviously, inflation has uh, has definitely increased over uh, the past couple of years, and you know, three years since those numbers were calculated. Uh, I don't have a, 
another another uh, number calculated for current for current prices and everything. So obviously we're just we're, we're going off of that what we calculated. Um, and the Lord knows. The Lord knows. He'll, he'll, he'll take care of us. But obviously, um, things are going to be more expensive over there generally. Uh, and as of right now, I'm sure things are probably getting more expensive. Uh, gas over there is, gen- when I was over there in 2019, I think it was somewhere around $5 a gallon. Uh, and that's, you know, that's just Australian gas. So I have no clue what it would be now. Um, uh, so obviously, that's things that we're thinking about and, and, and trying to prepare for. Um, uh, the things that we budgeted, we tried to budget uh, item. I sat down with Brother Heberly. We went line by line as many different bills and costs that we can think of, estimating as much as we could uh, to get to the number that we got to. And um, it was calculated a little, um, a little more than maybe we, we would need. Uh, so, Lord willing, uh, that'll all work out. But once again, we're, you know, the Lord, will, the Lord knows the Lord's going to take care of that. So, I, I don't know what the full effect of that's going to be until probably we get over there and, and really get a chance to see that. But the Lord's going to take care of that. So, amen. I think we've got time for maybe one more. Uh, that's an important question. Uh, you know, if a local church is accountability, you're pretty good with your local church. Or- yes, sir. To the missionary, because we've had experience. I mean, I've, I'm a retired pastor. I know exactly um, there's been good churches that sent out and had good accountability, and then there's been missionaries that have gone to the field, actually, absolutely gone awry. So, you know, that's a deep concern with churches. You know? Absolutely. My pastor, uh, my pastor, Pastor Tom Vineyard, who's a missionary in West Africa, Ivory Coast, uh, for 16, 16 plus years. Uh, so he's very familiar with missionary life and missionary concerns, and there's definitely uh, accountability there. In fact, uh, before I leave, I'll be handing off an envelope uh, that has a missionary inquiry form, a little little questionnaire thing for your, for the pastor or you to fill out uh, to send back to my church. Uh, obviously, accountability is very important to my church and my pastor, and we plan on having much accountability, not only with our sending church, but to all of our supporting churches also, uh, and everything like that, so uh, for sure. Are you going to seek dual citizenship? When you're yes. Here? Yes. Yes. Australia does offer dual citizenship, uh, so that is our goal to go for that. Uh, our visa we're applying for is a four-year work visa, uh, temporary four-year temporary work visa. Uh, we've been instructed and that that would qualify us to apply for permanent residency. So before the end of the four years, we should be able to apply for permanent residency. Uh, if we get permanent residency, uh, generally in the past two years, and you qualify for uh, applying for dual citizenship. Uh, obviously, I don't know if that's going to remain the case, if that's still the case. I do know it's still available. I just don't know what the timeline is. So we're, we're praying or and very, very hopeful for within about the fir- first six years, about within a six-year timeline, we should be able to apply for dual citizenship, if not sooner, maybe even four years. I know missionaries in the past have been able to get dual citizenship, with, sh- dual citizenship within four years. But that is definitely the goal, uh, to be able to get dual citizenship. So I think that's it uh, for this morning. We'll go ahead and pray and dismiss. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day you've given us, Lord, and the opportunity that we have to be in church, Lord. We thank you for this Sunday school hour, the time that we had to share. Lord, I pray you bless the morning uh, service coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.